Thank you, Brother Irby. And I have some notes that I've prepared for you. I got up at 5 a.m. this morning and decided to write you out some notes for today's message as we study the book of Job. And so I'd like for us to stand together as we, as we uh, begin this morning and open our Bibles to Job chapter 2 and verse 9. And Job's wife said to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? And Job replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And in all of this, Job did not sin in what he said. And may God bless his word to our hearts this morning. You may be seated. It's been about 14 months since I've been with you. It's so good to be uh, back with you today. And over that 14 months, we all know that the world's gone crazy. Amen? Amen. <laughs> And I perhaps, I, I know that perhaps some of you have gone through some very difficult and dark days. Perhaps some of you have been stricken with the sickness that they have called COVID-19. Perhaps some of you have lost your job. Perhaps some of you have lost some loved ones. And you've gone through the difficulties of life. So I thought Job was a good subject to speak on this morning. And if you allow me, over the next 40 to 45 minutes, we're going to sweep through the entire 42 chapters of the book of Job. <laughs> you know, Job is a confusing book to so many, but I want you to know it's really rather simple. People wonder, what is the book of Job even about? And some people say, well, the book of Job is about why bad things happen to good people. But can I tell you this morning, that's not what the book of Job is about. In fact, when I think about that statement, why do bad things happen to good people, I have two problems with that. And the first of all, there's no such thing as good people. The Bible says there's none good, no, not even one. The second thing about it, it's a ridiculous question. I was sitting in a McDonald's not too long ago, and I was looking around and I noticed something. As I was sitting in McDonald's, all these Big Macs and Quarter Pounders with cheese and Chicken McNuggets and McFlurries kept on happening. <laughs> it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out why. They were happening because I was sitting in McDonald's. And you wonder why bad things happen in this world. It's because of where we're sitting. In a fallen, broken, sin, ruined world. Job lived in the same world that we did. And this story is not about the how come. It's about the outcome. It's not about why bad things happened in Job's life. It was about the outcome of all of it in the end. You see, the book of Job begins with the remarkable record of Job's reputation. And it ends with the record of his repentance and restoration. You know, you can't understand and appreciate the book of Job until you understand and appreciate the person of Job. And so I want you to, to see that in chapter 1, in verse 1, it says, In the land of Uz there lived a man whose name was Job. And this man was blameless. And upright. You know what that means? It means he had moral fitness. He had seven, I mean, he, he feared God and he shunned evil. He had a magnificent faith. It goes on to say that he had seven sons and three daughters. And you go down and you look in verse 4, it says his sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. 
Early in the morning he would sacrifice burnt offering for each of them, thinking perhaps my children had sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And this was Job's regular custom. You know, there was a time in his children's life when they were young that Job was their provider, but when they became adults and began to party a little bit too much, he was no longer their provider, he was their priest. The more they feasted, the more he fasted. The more they partied, the more he prayed. Because he was meticulous in his fatherhood. And a minister in his fatherhood. He was also known, as you go on to see in verse 3, that he owned 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 donkeys. And he had a large number of servants. <laughs> he had massive wealth and fortune. And he was the greatest man, the Bible says, in all of the East. Monumental faith. It begins with this record of his remarkable reputation. But the way the book ends, it's with the record of his repentance and his restoration. Because, listen, you can have everything in the world and lose it like that. That's what happened to Job. You know the book, it begins... With the challenge rising up out of the gloomy gates of hell. But it ends with the champion rising up into the glorious gates of heaven. It begins with Job teaching us about how to live in this world with the earthly blessings of God. And it ends with Job teaching us how to leave this world with the eternal blessings of God. The book begins with Satan being defeated by God. And it ends with a saint being developed by God. I want us to look together at the entirety of this book. Really, it's five major events that took place. There were, first of all, Job in his major catastrophes, and then Job in his marital conflict, and then Job and his miserable comforters, Job in his magnanimous counselor, and then Job in his mighty creator. We can take those five sweeping major events that happen in the book of Job and divide those into two major sections. I've called it in your notes Act 1 and Act 2. Act 1. God defeating Satan. Aren't you glad that he does that? Amen. But that's certainly not what the book is about. It's about Act 2. God developing his saints. And may God bless the book of Job to our hearts this morning. I want us to look at, first of all, Job and his major calamity. I want you to see that first there was something that was secretly hidden from Job and then something that was suddenly handed to Job. There was something that was secretly hidden from him, some, something in chapter 1 and 2 that we know about that Job never knew about. His friends didn't know about it, his wife didn't know about it, the city didn't know about it, nobody knew about it. We know more than Job did. But in chapter 1, we see that Satan one day was just out and about and he came before God and God said to him, Satan, what are you up to? And Satan said, oh, you know me, God. I'm just roaming here and there, walking the streets, seeing what kind of trouble I can stir up. And God said to Satan, have you ever considered my servant Job? He's an upright man, and uh, I have no one like him on all the earth. He's blameless and upright. He's a man who fears God and shuns evil. Satan looked at God and said, oh, don't you know? Don't you know that the only reason that he loves you and serves you is because you put a hedge of protection around him, but if you were to strike him, he would curse you to your face. 
and so the challenge was on. The line had been drawn. And the dreadful day in Jill's life had come. That was all hidden from Joe. But suddenly, out of nowhere, something was handed to him. You'll notice what happens beginning in verse 13. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a, med a messenger came to Job. That was messenger number one, and then there was messenger number two, and then there was messenger number three, and messenger number four, and none of them had a good message to deliver. You'll notice what happened. Five horrible major calamities that fell upon Job. The first one is that all of his herdsmen were dead. It was unimaginable bloodshed. The first, they were out in the fields, and all of a sudden the Sabians came, and the herdsmen were watching over the oxen and the donkeys that Job owned. And the Sabians came, and they took every one of those animals, and then they pulled out their swords, and they slew every one of Job's herdsmen. The servants were dead. And then... No sooner had that message been delivered to him than someone else came knocking on Job's door and said, Job, I have terrible news. He says, some of your herdsmen, they were out in the fields with your sheep. We don't know what happened, Job. Just fire fell from the sky and burned up all the sheep. And not a servant survived. No longer had Job received that word that someone else came knocking at the door and said, Job, I have horrible news for you. You know those Chaldeans, they're at it again, Job. And your servants, they were out in the fields with your camels. They came and stole all of your camels, Job. They're all gone. And all of your servants were put to the sword. There's blood all over the field. And Job, I believe, when he heard those messages, he thought it was not about his animals. It was about his servants that he loved so much. Those men that he had hired, those men that had cared for his fortune, men that he loved in such unprecedented brutality were dead. Not only were his herdsmen dead, but his herds were depleted. Every one of them. Every oxen, every donkey, every sheep, every camel. Thousands of animals just instantly gone. And you know what that represented? That represented all of his fortune. Everything he owned, all of his material goods were now just gone. And it was a moment of unpredictable bankruptcy. You know, most people, when they face bankruptcy, 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 they at least see it coming. You know, the sheep market is down, the donkey market is down, the oxen market is down. We've got to do something to recuperate what we're about to lose. But no, this was all within the span of an hour. He couldn't see it coming. Usually you can see bankruptcy coming like a freight train at you, but... This was more like a speeding bullet coming at Job. He never even knew it was coming. Unpredictable bankruptcy. And if that wasn't bad enough, his home was devastated. Unbearable bereavement. Verse 18, while he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house. When suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house, and it collapsed on them, and they're all dead. And I'm the only one left to tell you about it, Job. All seven of his sons, all three of his beautiful daughters, instantly Unbearable 
bereavement. Well, that was one day. Job wished he had never woken up that morning. In fact, he wished he had never even been born. Bankrupt, bereaved, and he went and he sat on the outside outskirts of the city by the trash dump where the trash was burned and the dung of the city was burned. And he sat there and what the Bible tells us is that Satan not only had attacked his, his finances and his family, but now he was attacking his flesh as well. You'll notice what it says in verse In, in chapter 2, in verse 4, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job again? There's no one else like him. He's blameless and upright, upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. And Satan said, Skin for skin. You know why he said skin for skin? I have no idea. idea. He's an idiot. <laughs> but notice what he says a man will give all that he has for his own life but stretch out your own hand and strike his flesh and bones and you will surely, he will surely curse you to your face and then the Lord said to Satan very well then but he's in your hands but you must spare his life so Satan went out in the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. And then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it, and he sat among the ashes. Job's health was diminished. Uncurable blistering from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. If you read throughout the book of Job, you'll find out it was more than just blistering. It was a fever that was uncontrollable. It was his, he had gone bald. You know what he says? He says, thy crown of honor has fallen off of my head. Remember what you preached a few weeks ago? The crown of honor was his gray hair. It had all fallen out. He was as blonde as Dr., uh, as, as bald as, as Brother Dale over there. <laughs> he had uncontrollable diarrhea. Everything about Job, he's, he says later on in the book, he says, I'm nothing now but skin and bones. When Job's three friends came to visit him, the Bible says they couldn't even recognize him. And then we see that Job's heart was dejected. He moved out of his house in the inner part of the city where he was so well known and loved and admired. And he went and sat himself down at the trash dump and he sat among the ashes with unendurable brokenness. His herdsmen were gone. His herds were gone. His home, his children, they were gone. His health was gone. And his heart was gone too. A broken broken man. Well, I want you to notice, secondly, not only do we see his major calamities, but we also see his marital conflict. In chapter 2, again, verse 9, the scripture that we read earlier, Job's wife comes into the picture. You know, during all of his calamities, his life was falling apart, but now we see his wife falling And if you'll notice with me, she had a horrible attitude, a hurtful attitude. But we can't blame her, can we? Everything that Job had endured, she had endured. Perhaps with a heavier weight than he had. She too had lost the fortune. She too had lost her family. And now she was losing her husband. You can imagine that 
the attitude that she displays in this book is certainly reasonable and understandable. I don't believe that she was a bad woman. She just was a good woman with a bad attitude. It was thrown on her with all the turmoil that was going on in life. And it was really the result of the crises of life that were based on a grave moment. And indeed, this was a very grave serious, heavy moment in the marriage and in the life of Mrs. Job. I don't know how she endured it. I don't know how she was still standing under it, but she was, but it had affected her attitude. And with that attitude came some harsh advice. In chapter 2, in verse 9, she says, Are you still holding on to your integrity? What a mean, horrible thing to say to her husband. He had nothing left but his integrity. He had nothing left except for the holiness of his life and his trust and faith in God. What she was saying to him really was, Job, why don't you just let go of that? You've lost everything else. There's no sense in holding on to that. You're not worthy. You know what I believe that was going on in her heart was the same thing that was going on in the hearts of Job's friends. They came to him to comfort him, but they had to confront him with what they believed must have been sin in his life that caused this in the first place. You can imagine how Mrs. Job felt. What have you been up to, Job? What have you been doing in secret behind my back? That God would curse our family and take our children like this, Job. Your integrity. Let it go, Job. It's all you have left, but you're probably not worthy of it anyway. It was a mean statement. But it was a statement that came from a grieving mother. It was a reaction to all that was going on, but it got worse. She said, why don't you just curse God? Well, with that hurtful, harsh advice came a healing answer from Job. Job, in all of his anguish and agony, he looked up at his wife and he said, Oh, dear sweetheart, now put down that frying pan before I tell you this. <laughs> but uh, I'm not saying you're a foolish woman. Your words are like that of a foolish woman. Because you know, what I believe is we need to accept not only the good that comes from God that we've enjoyed all of our, all of our lives, Amen. but whatever trouble happens to come our way. And the Bible says then that in all of this, Job did not even dare to, to <laughs> sin with his words. It was a healing answer. And what it was, was it was based on the faith of a godly man. Because Satan may have taken away his fortune and his family, but he didn't take away his faith. Amen? It still stood firm. And that brings us to the close of Act 1. But wait a minute. I hope you didn't miss something here. I want us to back up just one moment and think about this marital conflict. And let you know that Satan was in the middle of all of it. But this was when he was about to have to get out of it. You know what he had done in Job's wife? In Job's wife, he had orchestrated a perfect plan to get Job what he wanted Job to do in the first place. And what he did was he made her miserable with Job. She endured everything he did. And then he made her mad at Job. What have you been up to, Job? God's doing this for a reason. You've done something. And then she made, he made her mad, at mean to Job, saying such harsh things, just curse God and die. Because he had made her to be his mouthpiece to Job. 
She had spoken the words that Satan needed spoken. Satan had said to God, take away everything he has and he'll curse you to your face. And his wife was now infiltrated with those words. Curse God and die. Satan launched his last attack. And you know what happened? Job was vindicated. God was victorious, and Satan was vanquished. We still have 40 and a half chapters of this entire book, and Satan doesn't show up anywhere because he got kicked out. Amen. You see, the problem with Job's wife was she was saying, how, how can we get out of this? But for Job, it was, no, not how can we get out of this, it's what can we get out of you know what I want more than anything else? He says, I don't want just to end it all. I want all the blessings that God gave us in the past restored to us in the future. That's what I want to get out of this. So I'm going to keep on believing and keep on trusting. Amen. And that's what Job did, and it brought the victory. God had won the challenge. He had defeated Satan. I know you're nervous. We have 40 and a half more chapters to go, but don't worry. <laughs> they sweep through pretty quick. For you. Act one was about God defeating Satan. That's what it was all about. Act two is about God now developing his saints. You see, when the victory was won, the whole book could have just come to a conclusion. Had I been God, and aren't you glad I'm not, I would have just said, okay, and then after Job had not said anything evil in all of this with his mouth, the victory was won. And God blessed the latter part of his life more than the former. He gave him double of all of his prosperity. He doubled his family, and Job lived another 140 years, and then he died an old man full of days. Amen. And the book would have been over. This sermon would be through. We would be driving to Applebee's for an early lunch. <laughs> Satan was done. Job was hoping it was done. But God wasn't done yet. God still had something he wanted to accomplish. And it wasn't answering the how come, it's answering the outcome. And during this intermission between Acts 1 and 2, I, I want us to think about a verse, James chapter 1 and verse 2. You probably know this by heart. Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith, isn't that what Job had gone through? Develops perseverance. And perseverance must run its full course so that you may be mature and complete and lacking in nothing. You know, God had said about Job when he talked to Satan, he said, if you consider my, ser my servant Job, he's perfect. Let me tell you, that was something, that was a statement about his, his standing and, and, and not his state. How many of you know that when you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, when God looks at you, he sees perfection because he sees his son. That was his status, his standing. But it wasn't his state. As good of a man as Job was, he wasn't perfect and mature and complete and lacking in nothing. There was something that was insidious in Job's heart. And so that begins act chapter, uh, the, the, the second act, God developing his servants. And I want you to notice, and we'll sweep through this quickly, Job and his miserable comforters. Three friends had come from a long distance to come and see Job. And when they came, they came with the idea that we are going to comfort Job, we are going to console Job. But instead of comforting and consoling, they confronted him and condemned him. Instead of coming sympathizing, they wound up sermonizing. 
And I want you to notice how that happened. His, confu- his, his accusers confronted him. They, first of all, had the sympathetic silence. They showed up. They sat down by Job. They did nothing. They sat in silence and just stared at him. And he stared at them. The first day was passing. He said, well, perhaps, perhaps at dark they'll just get up and go home. And leave me alone. But they stayed. Two days, three days, four days. They weren't going anywhere. For seven days they sat there in silence. Not a word was spoken. Perhaps the reason the word, well, no word was spoken was because it was an oriental tradition that when you were sitting in the presence of someone greater for, than you, you didn't speak until first they spoke. And Job wasn't going to say a word. Neither did they. But they were sitting there sympathetically in silence. Let me tell you something. When someone's going through a hardship of life, one of the best things maybe you can do is just sit and not say a word. Afraid of saying the wrong thing, they don't say anything. Amen? Amen. But then Job made a mistake. Chapter 3 and verse 1 after this, Job opened his mouth. And that was the invitation. For a whole chapter, he goes on saying, I wish I had never been born. I cursed the day I was born. I cursed the night that I was conceived. I wish I never even existed. And that was all the invitation these three people needed. To be converted, be converted from comforters to critics. And you know what they did? There were three of them. Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar. And Eliphaz, he was a little bit kinder than the other two. And what he did was he su- just suggested that Job possibly had sinned. He did that by making an association. He says, I've, I've never seen that, uh, that judgment has gone on, on, come upon someone who hasn't sinned. So, you know, that whole association of where there's smoke, there's probably fire. And Job, I'm not saying that you've sinned. I'm just suggesting that possibly you have. You know Job. You know. And then there was Bildad. Bildad took it one step further. He didn't make an association. He made an assumption. He said, I've never known anyone born of woman who has not been sinful. I've never known a mortal man who has not sinned against God. And Job, last I checked, you were born of a woman. And you're a mortal man. So, Job, I'm not saying that you've sinned. And I'm not just suggesting this, but I'm supposing, Job, that probably you have sinned. And then there was Zophar. Zophar was going to have none of that, you know. Zophar didn't suggest anything. He didn't suppose anything. There was no possibly or probably to it. Job, I mean, Zophar clearly stated Job had positively sinned. And you know what he said to Job? He said, if God gave you what you really deserved, your punishment would be much worse than what you're going through now. He was saying to Job, we don't know what you did, Job. (laughs) We know you did it. No wonder in chapter 16, Job looks at them and calls them miserable comforters. (laughs) Because that's what they were. And Job, rather than just sitting in silence and taking all the brutal beatings that they were giving him with their mouths, he, he argued, and their argues contradicted them. You know what he believed? He believed he was being tested undeservedly for his calamities, that he was being tried unfairly by his critics, and that most of all, he was being treated ungod, unjustly by his God. He said, I haven't deserved any of this. Can I tell you something? Eliphaz was wrong. Bill Dad was wrong. Zophar was wrong. And Job was wrong. 
And so God <laughs> sent a, magnan a magnanimous <laughs> counselor. I hesitated using that word magnanimous because it's just a big magnanimous word. <laughs> but I really had to. You know, I like to alliterate everything. This fit really well. I looked the word up because I'm not really a master of the English language. And some words I need to really make sure I understand clearly. And when I looked it up, I saw that the word magnanimous means this courageous spirit, nobility in feeling, and generosity of mind. And I said, that was Elihu. A courageous spirit. Nobility, nobility in his feelings toward Job. A generous generosity of mind. Speaking the very words that God had planted in his mind and his heart to share with Job. And he came as a counselor. He came as a, as a messenger. And what he did was he had great character in his speech. He was compassionate in his speaking. He was courageous in his spirit despite his age. And he was competent in his sermon despite his abilities. He said, I'm just a clay pot like you and I, like you are, Job. I'm nothing. And I'm not really able to speak for God. But God's going to empower me to speak to you, Job. Something that you need to hear. And that's exactly what God did. Not that, Joe, not that Eli Hughes sermon was perfect. Listen, I've never known of a perfect preacher, amen, or a perfect sermon, save the Sermon on the Mount preached by the perfect preacher named Jesus. If God were to ever ask me if I had any suggestions for the Sermon on the Mount, I would say, well, God, you know it was perfect. You really can't improve upon it. But I would have alliterated it, and I would have put it in a gospel named not Matthew, but Mark. <laughs> Here he came, preaching a word from God. He exposed the smallness and the wrongness of mortal man. He rebuked Job's miserable counselors for daring to charge Job with committing iniquities against God. And then he turned to Job and he refuted Job's arguments for charging God with committing injustices against Job. He said, you three miserable counselors, you're wrong. Job, you are wrong. But then he exalted the supremacy of God and the wonders You just need to look through this. You know, I gave you these notes so that you can kind of make this study your own. But can I just tell you the four things real quickly, what he was exalting God about? That God would never be unjust, and that's in chapter 34. Job had accused God of injustice. He said, God's treating me unjustly. I've done nothing wrong, but yet God's treating me like I have. God's picking on me as being unjust. And Elihu says, no. God can never be unjust. And then he says, God would never be uncaring in chapter 35. Job thought, you know, God's just out there. He doesn't care who sins and who doesn't sin. He doesn't care what's happening here or there. God just isn't paying attention and he doesn't care. And Elihu says, no, 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 Job. God is never be then in chapter 36, he begins to really get down to the core of the problem. He says the problem is that not just that God would never be unjust and that God would never be uncaring, but God could never be understood. He says, Job, do you know what you're trying to do? You're trying to understand God. Quit it. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Oh, Job, don't ever try to understand God. Just keep the faith and accept what he gives to you, Job. And know that he's good, he's not unjust, he's not uncaring. Amen. And then he said, God, um, God should never be underestimated either. I want you to uh, mark these words. 
Eli, Elihu looked at Job and he said, you know what, if you would dare stand before men and point an accusing finger at God, you've underestimated God. Because he's not going to put up with it, Job. You think you've been dealt with harshly so far for nothing that you had done wrong. Just imagine what God's capable of, do, capable of doing now, Job. And you know what the consequences of that message was? Job is finally silenced. When his three friends gave their speeches, Job gave his speeches back. He wouldn't shut up about how good he was, about how unfair God was. But it took the anointing of a man named Elihu who came and stood before Job to finally silence Job. And he was suddenly suddenly surrendering. Remember, perseverance must finish its course so that it may do what? Mature and complete and make you lacking in nothing. Do you know there was something in Job's life? And so as we close this morning, we see Job and his mighty creator. I, I want you to, to, to turn over because you just need to see all this. And in chapter 38, when God starts speaking, you know what Elihu was? He was the preparation for the keynote speaker of the evening. <laughs> Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they didn't really have much worth hearing. Elihu did. But he was just preparing the way. He was a John the Baptist for God that day. Preparing Job's heart for what the keynote speech was going to be about. And we see that God was gently reminding Job of his inferior position. He said, you want to obscure my judgments, Job? You dare to stand before me as your God and accuse me of wrong? Job, let me reason with you for just a moment. May I reason with you? And he began to ask Job a series of questions. He says, Job, look at verse 38. In verse 4, he says, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth, Job? You know, before you were born. Where were you, Job? Where were you? Tell me if you understand. And Job, I, I want to know if you can understand the natural universe. So, so tell me, who marked off the earth's dimensions? Surely you... No, Job. Verse 11, when I said, this far you may come and no further, and here is where your proud waves halt, and suddenly the seas came to an end. Job, were you the one who did that, Job? Were you even there? Verse 21, surely you know, for you were already born, weren't you, Job? And you have lived so many years. Oh, Job, you're so wise. You know what he was doing? He was gently reasoning with Job to put Job in his place. How many of you know that God sometimes just needs to put us in our place? And that's where Job was. He then reached into the celestial worlds. In verse 31, he says, Job, I wonder... Can you bind the beautiful Pallades? Can you loose the cords of Orion? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or lead out the bear with its cubs? He was looking not only at the terrestrial world, but the celestial worlds. He said, Job, have you ever even been up there before? Because I have. I could unbound Orion's belt and every star would just scatter. And by the time you died, they would be light years away from each other, Job. I did that. Then he looks at the animal kingdom. He says, Job, let me simplify it a little bit more. You're, you're an agrarian. You know about livestock. Let me ask you about the animal kingdom, Job. Chapter 39, verse 1. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? 
you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Verse 5, who let the wild donkeys go free, Job? You think they're domesticated animals or they're wild animals? You think they can't live in the wild? They can live in the wild because I make them live in the wild, Job. Can you do that? And then he says in verse 9, will the wild ox consent to serve you, Job? Just at the sound of your voice? No, you've got to put them through training and training and training. All I do is speak the word and they obey me, Job. Can you do that? And do you give the horse his strength? Verse 26, does the hawk take flight by your wisdom? Verse 27, does the eagle soar at your command? He says, Job, I could go on and on and on, but I won't. Job, you just need to know you're in an inferior position than I am, Job. So you need to straighten up, Job. He reasoned with them. I don't know about you, but I think that was pretty good reasoning. Amen? Amen. But then he rebuked Job. He rebuked Job for his insidious pride. Well, now we get really right down to where the rubber meets the road. God was, after defeating Satan, developing his saints, because there was something lacking in Job. This good and perfect man was good and imperfect. Because of what dwelt inside his heart, it was insidious. Again, a word I looked up to make sure I understood what the meaning was. And when I did, I shouted with joy because this is exactly what Job is going through. You know what the word insidious means? Having a gradual and cumulative effect, subtle. Move on to point out what happened with Job. He didn't wake up with a pride and haughty spirit. It grew over the years because he was such a good man. And he became prideful about that. It's related to a disease in this way, developing so gradually as to be well established before it's ever even detectable. Like cancer. You don't know that you have it until you've had it long enough to establish itself in the very core of your being. That's where Job was. This pride. And so Job, God rebuked Job. In verse 40, um, chapter 40 and verse 15, he, he makes mention of, of, of an animal called a behemoth. It was a land-dwelling animal. We don't know exactly what it was, but it was behemoth. It's a huge animal, an untainable animal. He says to Job, can you control that animal, Job? That animal that's much bigger than you and much stronger than you, do you think you can control it? It was interesting this week. This week I heard on the radio the story about American people being interviewed. And 15% of people interviewed believed that they could fight and win against the lion. That 9% of American people believe that they can fight and win against a bear. And I thought, how fitting that is for this. God looked at Job and said, you think you can tame, control a behemoth, Job? And the answer, of course, it was a rhetorical question. It was making a statement, not asking a question. But the answer was, no, no. And what makes you think you can control me, Job? And then he looked at a sea-bearing animal. In chapter 41, it was called the Leviathan. We don't know exactly what that was, but it was a huge animal that lived in the sea. And he said, you think you could put a fish hook in it, in it through its nose and just lead it wherever you want it to go, Job? You think you could control it? And, oh, no. No. But then you get down to the end of chapter 41. And God, comparing himself to the Leviathan, says, nothing on earth is his equal. And Job, nothing is my equal on this earth. A creature without fear. And Job, I want you to know you can condemn me all you want. And accuse me of injustice. I don't fear you, Job. You need to fear me. And he looks down on all that are haughty. He is king 
over all that are proud. And there, God laid it upon Job. He says, this is not the how come of your circumstances, Job. But I want this to be the outcome of your circumstances. To mature you and complete you, you're lacking in nothing, Job. This one thing keeps you from really being as perfect as you can be, Job. You've got horrible pride. And it's caused such a haughty spirit in you. And Job, that is detestable to me. And then, having said all of that, he graciously reconciled Job with an immediate pardon. Aren't you glad that God does that? The most dreadful of sins that you can commit against God to dare to accuse him of injustice. And all God did is he said, Job, go and pray for your erring friends who had accused you of other wrongs. And he did. And God said, I have heard Job's prayer. You know what it means that God hears our prayers? It means that he's pardoned us. He's forgiven us of the waywardness of our hearts. And we're back in fellowship with him. And then God generously restored Job with increased prosperity and posterity. Notice what it says in verse, in verse 40, uh, 42. It says, after Job had prayed for his friend, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. Verse 12, the Lord blessed the latter part of his life more than the first. He had 14,000 sheep. How many did he have in chapter 1? 7,000. Now he had 14,000. Goes on to say, 6,000 camels. He had 3,000 in chapter 1. 1,000 yoke of oxen. He had 500 of those in chapter 1. And 1,000 donkeys. He had only 500 of those in chapter 1. He doubled all of Job's prosperity. And then he doubled Job's posterity. He doubled his family. Because the Bible says that, uh, that he gave him 14 sons and 6 daughters. No, wait. I think there's a mistake in my version of the Bible. Yours is right, right? 14 sons, 6 daughters, is that what it says? Oh my. God must have made a mistake. The liberals are right. The Bible's not in it. <laughs> but let me tell you something. God didn't make a mistake. Job had lost his oxen. They were gone forever. He had lost his donkeys. They were gone forever. He had lost his camels and his sheep. They were gone forever. But there was something he hadn't lost because they were gone forever. Uh, I want you to see God gloriously receiving Job into his immortal presence. Notice what it says. That Job lived, in verse 16, 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. And he died old and full of years. Amen. <laughs> Glory. He got to heaven. And when he got to heaven... A few more years had passed. The seven sons and three daughters that God had given to Job in the latter part of his life all made their way to heaven. And Job, in the presence of God and his angels, looked at his family and he counted 14 sons and six daughters. What a great. We serve. 